Hello everyone. Today is December 27th, 2017. My topic today is the Swan Night. Now, unlike most people, I would imagine, I was not familiar with the Swan Night of the Grail Legends. I don't even recall that I was aware it existed, but I might have been prior to when I received information on the Swan Night, which would have been mm, a long time ago. Well, not too long, I guess, uh, 2010 or something like that. Maybe pre previous to that, probably 2008, something like that. I don't know exactly. But anyway, I, I received that uh, an individual who um, is a friend and colleague of mine was a swan knight. This is what Thoth was calling him, so to speak. And um, having to do with, well, I'm going to get to that in a moment. <laughs> but anyway, so recently, just the other day, in fact, I realized that there were certain other individuals, all men, that I knew personally that were colleagues of mine as well um, who had, there was a certain vibration about them. They were very different people yet they had they shared similar integrity and consciousness and yet there was this vibration that seemed to be very strongly connected to both. Um, I've forgotten about the Swan Knight thing in regard to one of the individuals. I mean, I really wasn't thinking about it. I was just thinking these particular gentlemen all seem to share this both extreming kind of energy that I couldn't put into words. So it was very frustrating. And I thought, I've just got to find the key to this. So this morning I just said, though, please just tell me what the commonality is here. And he said, they're all swan knights. And I went, wow, that makes sense. Even though I really have never in detail questioned him about what the swan knight meaning is. He's giving me some information. So I decided to Google the swan knight. And I came up with him and all kinds of stuff on him. And, you know, he's obviously in the Grail Legends. Uh, but I didn't really know that when I received that term. Um, and... So I, I wanted to find something that was a little more immediate about his the connection of the swan, swan knight archetype that goes beyond the Grail legend myth, which of course contains many facts as well, but it's all kind of woven into the myth. And I Googled until I found uh, something called on it, the Atlantis Arising magazine, which they have at least certain articles online. And I found this really interesting. So I'm going to read to you from this magazine, and then I'm going to go to Thoth in regard to you know, kind of putting it all together. And why would this come up for me now? Uh, what's the significance? You know, going into it on that, on that level. So we're first we're going to start, though, with the article itself. Okay, so you can see that it's on the Atlantis Rising Magazine Library. And here we have Legend of the Swan Knight. Now, it's a long article, and it's really quite interesting. But I'm not going to read it all to you, but I'm going to read some of it because it's very germane to what we're talking about here, obviously. So here we start with the legend, the Grail and the Swan Knight. The legend of the Swan Knight, as we know it, is from the Grail literature. Grail stories and the Crusades seem to be strongly linked in an idyllic age of Camelot. Linked together in an idyllic age of Camelot. In the 50 years between 1180 and 1230, the 10 principal versions of the Grail legend were produced. They made ideals of chivalry purity, courage, and valor. Writers like Sir Thomas Mallory and, now I can't pronounce this one correctly, apologies, but 
Sh uh, Shretin de Troy created the world of Camelot and blended together everything from the Celtic tales to the Arthurian legends from five centuries before the Knights Templar, which were the mo more modern to them. One of the last of the traditions was written by Wolfram von Isenbach entitled Parcival. His story includes the son of Parcival, a man named Longhigrin. In his infancy, Longhigrin, like Moses, was floated on a mystic vessel until he was found and raised by a queen in a foreign land. Like the British Lancelot, he would become a savior of women. In the story that became the source of Wagner's um, 1850 opera, Longhigrin, sorry, Longhigrin, I've got to say that right, is summoned from the Grail Temple at the castle of, oh my gosh, a big long name, okay, which is believed to be Montserrat in Catalonia. He travels in a swan boat, described as a boat pulled by swans to Antwerp, now a city of Belgium. At the time, Belgium was a province owned by Spain. His mission was to rescue Elsa of Brabant from Frederick of Telemund, Tel Ramund, who wanted to force her into marriage. Lunkengren, as a Knight Templar of the Holy Grail, was destined to be the hero. He told Duchess Elsa that he would marry her, but she was told he must never reveal his name, ancestry, or origins, and she must never ask. At some point, she was goaded by his rivals into asking the taboo question. When she did, he told her he had to leave and go to the Mount of Paradise. The Swan Knight's real home was always said to be a mountain where Venus the goddess lived or was present in the grail. To some, this was Monsignor, the last bastion of defense from the cat for the Cathars, the pure ones who were the victims of the church's persecution and slaughter. Monsignor is alternatively dedicated to Bellicina, the Astart Artemis Diana type goddess of the Celtic Iberians. The goddess of various names had priestesses who were called doves. The doves would be the emblem employed by the Cathars in the 13th century as, and the Huguenots, French Protestants of later centuries. While the different elements in the story appear to combine Celtic tales and con continental fairy tales, the story of the Swan Knight actually preceded the writings of Mallory and von Isenbach. Godfrey de Bouillon, I'm probably really butchering these names, apologies, was the first of the crusaders to reach and conquer Jerusalem. He turned down the title of King of Jerusalem, and his bravery and piety was the material for the legends that would grow around him. And so at that early date, it's saying that, that um, he was said to be a swan knight, a descendant of the swan. Oh, he was, yeah, he was said to be the swan knight or descendant of the swan knight. And it goes on with all the legends and the different things that happen with all of this. But let's get down to this. While the legends that grew around Geoffrey are celebrated, or Godfrey, Godfrey are celebrated, the true story is just as interesting. He was not, as some legends declared, descendants from Dagobert, thus entitling him to claim the Merovingian bloodline. Instead, he descended from Pepin of Heristal, Charlemagne's grandfather, which did earn him a place in the Mer Merovingian bloodline. The thesis of Holy Blood, Holy Grail is that the Merovingian bloodline actually could be traced to the biblical David through Jesus. Well, actually, <clears throat> Soth agrees with that. However, he says that there's a lot there that's not correct in the whole story of it. He's never corrected it to me, but he said that. And also, of course, from the Thoth extreme is that um, Jesus and Mary had only one child. Um, that is John Martinus. And from him, all this lineage took place because he did marry and have children. And so 
you know, that's where it comes from. But yes, he agrees that the Merovingian bloodline is a uh, Jesus bloodline, but it's not as it is depicted in many ways. The mother of Jesus, Mary, was said to have been a virgin at the time she conceived Jesus. Similarly, Merovec or Merovi, a word that comes from the Latin word for mother and sea, was a king born miraculously. Merovi was the progenitor of the Merovingians. The Swan Knight has an equally mysterious origin. A genealogy of Geoffrey's father takes the family back to the time of the Franks through Merovec all the way back to Pyram of Troy. While this may sound like a fantastic and magnanimous claim, many believe the refugees of Troy actually settled in France as well as Italy and England. This could account for the center of learning. Troyes, the city named for the suit, suitor of Helen, Paris. Aha, we have Troyes and Paris. Makes sense to me. Now, let's pause just a moment to say from the Thothic uh, Akasha, we have that Helen, uh, was it Helen of Troy? No, it wasn't Helen of Troy, it was the other one. Cassandra, the, um, the oracle. She wound up in Greece and became an oracle there. And then um, from the lineage of Helen, Helen is connected to um, Torhanna. And I cannot remember at this moment, it's written down somewhere, what Thoth says the connection is, but they are related. Helen of Troy and Torhanna, who is from Egypt, remember, she's the Egyptian priestess who came into, um, who became the Skoda that fat finally wound up in uh, Lassenbury. So it's kind of a whole trail of events, but we see here the sacred lineage because Torhanna was, according to Thoth, later or earlier incarnated. Uh, was it earlier or later? Mm -hmm. I think it was later incarnated as the Virgin Mary. So yes, it was later, definitely. So we have this whole scenario winding up and down the trails of the divine family. As Geoffrey was quick to turn down the crown of Jerusalem, his brother Baudouin was just as quick to fit, take the title. In one story of King Arthur, Baudouin, more commonly Baldwin, and his descendants also represent the lineage of the Swan Knight. The doctrine of noblesse oblige di dictates that they take and hold the city of Jerusalem. While the story of the Knight of the Swan may end after the fall of Jerusalem Acre, as well as the subsequent suppression of the Templars, it doesn't. One of the cultures Templars were in one of the cultures Templars were influenced by was the Mandineans. This group worshipped Saint John the Baptist as the true God on earth. The Templars worshipped Saint John as well, making him their patron saint and his feast day the most celebrated of the year. Well, even being a, a priory of the Templars, I must confess I didn't realize that the Templars were so um, attuned to St. John. And uh, this is very interesting because um, from the Thoth Akashic, the John the Apostle and John of Revelations are the same soul. I don't know if they're the same body, but they were the same soul. And at least as John the Apostle, Thoth overlaid that soul, and it was one of the five souls of John the Apostle, not the root soul, but one of the five souls. Okay, we continue. The Mandineans believed that once the soul left the body, it needed to pass through the North Star to, star to return home. The North Star to them was the Neb, the Swan constellation. In Europe, an order of knights connected with the Templar of the Grail claimed descendant, descent from the divine swan hero. The Gelders and Cleves families 
bore a swan on their arms to honor the ancestors, the Knight of the Swan. And now we get to the celestial meaning behind the myth. The myths and legends from the ancient to medieval times often serve to pass along knowledge that would be out of the realm of understanding for most people. The Bible, the Iliad, and the myths of many cultures often share a surface story that can be appreciated by all and a much more important message under the surface. In Greek myth, the swan is at once a mythical personage and like other mythical people, a constellation. As Cygnus, the constellation, it is one of the most recognizable star clusters of the northern hemisphere northern summer and fall skies. It is a northern constellation lying on the plain of the Milky Way. Greeks believed that this was where life on earth originated. In the Greek myth, mythic version, Cygnus is Zeus, disguised as a swan, seducing Leda, the queen of Sparta. She gave birth to a girl, Helen, Zeus pretended to be a swan, took refuge in the bosom of Nemesis. He ravished her and she had an egg. <laughs> Hermes, which is Thoth, threw the egg between Leda's thighs as she sat on a stool with legs apart. Leda gave birth to Helen. In most accounts, Zeus forced himself on Leda as a swan and she laid an egg from which Helen was hatched. The word Lana is the Lycanian or, or Christian word for woman. If we strip this myth down, it mean, mean the cosmic father coupled with woman, and she turned for the egg and started human life. We're going to address that in a moment, but I'm just continuing here. In Greek mythology, Helen was not simply a woman whom Paris abducted. She was the mother of moon goddess who gave the early Greeks her name, Helene. In various dialects, she was Hel, Helga, Ella, Hole, and Holde. Barbara Walker writes that her name was shared in Central Europe, where Holland, Helsinki, Helboland, and Holstein were all named for this often dark aspect of the goddess. Um, in Egypt, pardon me, we'll start again. In Egypt, her shrine was at a place the Greeks called Latopolis, Esna, in modern times, long before Greeks, the brightest star in the constellation Cygnus and the 19th brightest star in the night sky was known as Deneb. We can only guess at just how much importance was placed on both that star and the constellation in general. Other cultures besides Greece believed that Cygnus was nothing short of the birthplace of mankind. Well, as I'm reading down here, I see they're referring to St. John the Baptist again. So perhaps it was that St. John the Baptist that the uh, Knights Templar revered. I'm not sure about that. I'm sure someone could correct me on it. <laughs> but um, in any case, I just wanted to put that in there because I was assuming that the St. John was the Apostle John, but apparently not. While modern man, especially scientists, have little room for including myth with their work, at least one group feels differently. The Minial Institute, founded by consultants at the Jet Propulsion Labs of California, detected that 40,000 years ago, Sirius gave off a high level of rays that reached the Earth and influenced human life. They state that such cosmic rays from the constellation of Cygnus brought humanity out of the Stone Age intellectually. Cave art reflects the stars dating back to this period. In 1973, Carl Sagan made the claim that cosmic rays had an impact on the evolution of life on Earth. NASA took this seriously and began monitoring a star in the constellation Cygnus known as X3. This star is not visible, as the tail of the swan de Neb is so bright. However, NASA has determined that cosmic rays are emitted from X3 and are directed at the planet Earth. Geneticists are exploring the possibility that when the highest concentration of such cosmic rays reached the Earth, 
the evolution of man preceded at its fastest. From China to India and Europe and North America, what might seem like science fiction now was considered knowledge by the ancients. The myths vary from Cygnus as being the doorway to the sky people to Cygnus as the boat that sails through the river called the Milky Way pulled by a celestial bird. A likely conclusion is that ancient builders from Karahanjik to Newgrange had a deep understanding of the birth of life, which of of the birth of life, one of which modern science has only recently become aware. Well, this is a very good article, and now I'd like to address it from the Thothic perspective. Before I do, and I've said this many times, but I know there are new people that are listening to this. They're probably going, why cannot, why can't she read? <laughs> well, there are two factors to that. One is that I'm dyslexic. But the main one right now is that I have cataracts, and I am planning to have cataract surgery, hopefully sooner rather than later. But for right now, my nose is literally to the screen when I'm reading this stuff to you. So I apologize, but you know I'm not going to be daunted. I'm going to keep going with this because I believe that I need to be doing that. So here we go. And so now, what does, um, what does Thoth have to say about all of this? Well, I honestly don't remember what he originally said about the Swan Knight. It wasn't much. It was more that what the, what the archetype personified. And that was someone who uh, revered women, who uh, was uh, not in a poetically fanciful way, but in a true understanding of their role as a balanced um, polarity with, with man. And... Um, who was also a protector and a um, a visionary in a sense in regard to finding the pathways that best supported the feminine consciousness on the planet. And without our swan knights, the the feminine thread would not find its passage, its way through. Um, so we could see the swan knight as a a uh, archetypal a living energy archetype uh, that performs a duty on the planet. But we can also see it as individual souls incarnated in that particular time, whatever the, whenever it is, as a male, who are devoted to that energy, and it literally moves through them in, to various degrees. But we also now, according to what I'm receiving, see that indeed, Cygnus, the star, the cosmic star, is giving off the rays that radiate um, the consciousness of the earth to follow the grace factor of universal concordance. We have chaos that is a necessary element in the universe as we understand it because we have come into a realm that. Um, uses chaos to form sentience and awareness. But there's a greater realm, and that realm is the realm of grace. So we have two spheres that we hold in our light consciousness. One is chaos with a capital C, and it has a, a purpose. It's a divine principle. But the other one, is grace and grace supersedes chaos always and when we live our lives we generally live it in chaos I mean we can say oh I'm not too chaotic I haven't but no <laughs> if you're on this planet and you're having to do things and make a living and deal with family issues and deal with all these things that are that on relationships and you know you're living in chaos it may be a, a much subtler degree than somebody else but it's still chaotic. But you're a child of grace. You're a divine being. And as a divine being, that is something that performs an act of pure harmonic. It's a pure harmonic state. It's, it's non-chaotic. It's registering various energies, but always in a harmonious way. So as a child of that factor, you're a child of grace because grace allows the soul to move beyond its 
inheritance of chaos and into the sublime. If there were no chaotic realm that we were dealing with, then there wouldn't be any grace because grace is, an, is a choice out of chaos. And that said, the Grail Knight represents the grace factor. Uh, not so much the grace factor itself, let me correct that, but the path out of chaos into grace. So as an archetype, that's what it represents. As an individual person walking around, they might have some chaos in their lives too, but they're dedicated. The swan, what the Thoth is dubbing the swan knight. What he's calling individual men on this planet as swan knights. These are men that no matter how much chaos they might have, how many mistakes they may make, whatever, their soul is dedicated in that in male incarnation to serving the divine feminine principle. And not just serving it, but guiding it into a resonant field with the masculine male. Now that said, these swan knights don't just grow on trees. <laughs> they come out of the human element, the human experience. So you can have a little baby boy born somewhere, you know, anywhere in the world. He may have a rough time of it, a really rough time of it. He may grow up to be just a mess. <laughs> this is possible. I'm not saying every real knight follows this pattern now. I'm just saying this is one sort. He can be just, you know, way into the, you know, the whole masculine motorcycles and tattoos and drugs and a woman a night and all this kind of stuff. I mean, this is, I'm going to the extreme, but this could be going on in his life. And then he has an epiphany, something that brings him to his knees. And in doing so, he is transformed step by step, perhaps more immediately into a grail night. And that's one way. Another way is a fellow is just born with a natural sense of, you know, harmony in, in his life, even though he has to go through his own chaotic stuff. And he comes to recognize his role with the divine feminine in a very natural and organic way. So, as you can see by my demonstrations here, uh, that the Grail Knight can arise from many different ways, in many different ways. Those are the two extremes. And there's everything in between. Now, are all Grail Knights um, somehow genetically connected to the Syrian, I mean, sorry, not the Syrian, the Cygnus constellation? Like, you know, some original beings came from Cygnus and their, their swan boats, their vehicles, and, you know, their Merkabas, and all the Grail Knights are descended from them? Well, no, not on a genetic level. There are genetic personages, male and female, that are of the swan, the Cygnus lineage. And these are individuals who came to the earth when the beings from Cygnus, and there weren't a lot of them, I mean, not a lot of them that came to earth, came here at certain junctures of time, not just one. There were like, I believe Thoth is telling me like there were three different times that beings from Cygnus came here for very specific purposes. Now, he's always told me that well, first there's the triad. There's Orion, uh, most specifically the Blue Star, but the Orion complex is a metatronic uh, station because everything has a metatronic and oratronic to it. So we're talking about the Orion of the metatronic station, Sig uh, Sirius of the metatronic station, and the Pleiades of the metatronic station. He calls them the, tri the trigram, I believe it is, or tri something rather. I should have learned it by now. He's called it that since the 1980s, but I can't quite remember <laughs> at this moment. Anyway, try something. And then he's also added in the 1980s, uh, later than that, he added Cygnus, not as part of the tri triplex. That's it, the triplex. Not as part of the triplex, but as an important adjunct to that. And he never really gave me a lot of information about it. I do recall a little myself and two or three people, a group of us going out into the woods in San Antonio, Texas, and doing some kind of a ceremony with Cygnus. That was when he first told me about that energy, but I don't remember much about it at all. So anyway, he 
has pointed to Cygnus as an important element in the whole creational story of the Earth, but never given it much of an identity in that. Now he is saying it at the very least that it is true that these radiation of energies that come to Cygnus work to combine with the original templates, template that was put into place by the um, master builders out of well, the Sunboat clan out of the Ustar or in Orion. And so it's, it's kind of a, a, an elixir that was brought forth from Cygnus to work its magic in this realm. Um, and it's part of the whole plan of raising Soros, a, ri a raising Soros, a rising Osiris, of a rising Osiris. So the Cygnus energies are part of that plan. But I'm not going to go off on Cygnus too much right now. This is interesting, and I'd like to actually get right into the Thoth Akasha on the library book of Cygnus and get more information on the constellation itself and its purpose with this planet. But right now, I want to stay on the Swan Knights. So, is there a Swan Knight manual or what? <laughs> Not really, because as I said, it, there's a varying degrees of all of this. And the Swan Knight in this modern time and element could be, rep, could be related genetically to the Swan Knight or the Swan family. I should say the, the family of the Swan. Um, but paragenetically, he would always be related to it. Now, paragenetics is, is something that I was given knowledge of in the 1970s. And that is, very briefly, because I've written a lot about it, <clears throat> um, the soul actually can carries through from incarnation to incarnation genetics. It's a paragenetics. It's the universal genetics. And it um, connects to many lifetimes that they have had, but they could enter a genetic strain that has no relationship to the paragenetics or aspect of the paragenetics that the soul enters in with. So when he brings, he or she brings in that paragenetic strain, the soul does, into an incarnational body that is not genetically oriented to that paragenetic strain, all hell breaks loose. <laughs> no, not really. I'm just teasing. But it causes a conflict. However, it's a good conflict because, in this sense, because then the genetics, the, the real genetics, has to open up. It has to open up and receive the divine emissary of the paragenetic sequencing. And when it does that, you know, there's going to be a little wrestle, a little struggle there. The soul's probably saying, why was I born into this family? How many people have said that? Their paragenetics came in to, to orchestrate a divine change within that genetic family. And indeed, if that person never has a child ever in that family, they will have still changed the genetics of that family so that their brother's kids or, you know, whatever, they will have it. Any children out of that lineage after that point, and not even after that point, actually, I mean, this gets really wild, but it, it's, we're talking about quantum reality here. It actually changes the past as well. It, it, it's in varying degrees. It depends upon the situation, how much the past genetic field has changed as a result of that or how much the future has changed as a result of that. It's all, there's variables, there are many variables. I'm making it really, really super sim simple as I'm just making this statement. So, back to the Swan Knights. They come in with the true Cygnus paragenetics, whether they were, whether the, the what they're coming into was related or not. And when they do that, they transform that genetic field to be a Cygnus field. So this is really, you know, pretty nifty, I think. And of course, this doesn't just go on with the Cygnus thing. And when we're talking about the whole law of paragenetics. This is happening with a lot of different strains and things. But back to the Swan Knights, this is what's occurring. Now, 
also mentioned in this material was the children of the Swan Knights. And we hear, you know, the Swan Knight has children with the, the damsel and, and they become, you know, a generation of, of swan beings. So females, while they're not swan knights, perhaps, although I'm a big believer in women, women being able to be knights as well, because I am a Knights Templar and I, I know the term is dame for women and I respect that. However, I see myself more as a knight. So, you know, that's a play on words, doesn't really matter. But um, with the Swan family, we can call them anything we want, but they're related to the Cygnus sacred geometry in the DNA. So to, con to continue with this, what started this all for me, trying to figure out why these particular individual gentlemen that I know, um, that are my colleagues and friends, are um, have the same vibrational field around them. I was trying to determine what that was. And it was one that was especially, I don't know how to put it, like Thoth has his eye on this. It's like part of his, there's an energy attention from the Thoth extreme on these individuals and they're all sharing this envelope or this. So that's what started all this. And then I got, oh, well, they're all swan knights. So now my question is, why does, why is, I'm just putting this metaphorically, but why is Thoth's eye on them? You know, what is, what's the scoop there more than so than anything else? Well, um, so that's where I'm going with this right now. Well, he's alerting me to the um, story that I just read you on uh, Atlantis Rising. It has to do with um, the, the part where uh, Hermes, which is Thoth, puts the egg between the thighs of um, the birthing mother, and she gives birth to Helen. Um, so the Thoth stream, you know, we see Thoth as the scribe, and we know that there are the halls of Amenti, which is actually the Thothic Akasha. So his purpose in all of this, in the, we're speaking now of the Swan Knights, and indeed the swan children, but especially the swan knights in this moment, um, is to follow that path and bring it into the Akashic field in a particular, <laughs> I'm going to say, cataloging. Now, we look at the Akashic library, okay, in the Akashic segment that is the library of Thoth. But we're all, when we use any of these terms, we're talking about quantum mechanics. We're talking about cosmic. We're talking about fields of consciousness and things be even beyond what we understand as consciousness. So when we say that Thoth is cataloging the adventures of the Swan Knights, the initiations of the Swan Knights, the service of the Swan Knights, we mean that it is being taken in and registered into the atomic field of the planet. And in doing so, it radiates outward into that field and it brings uh, into the um, whole planetary sphere a greater awareness, a greater duty to the similitude of the divine male and the divine female. And furthermore, the central sun atoma of the planet, atoma is the word for this energy field that is in the center of the earth, the center of the body, the center of the, of the galaxy, the center of the universe and universes, and on and on. And maybe you could say in the center of the forehead of God, if you wanted to be very poetic here. <clears throat> so the, the central atoma of the earth 
within the anatoma is what Thoth calls the planetary genius. And it's not just his term. Rudolf Steiner used it as well. But Thoth gives it a an, sort of an extra twist, much extra twist. And anyway, so this planetary genius, according to Thoth, is the record, the true record of the entire <clears throat> divine Earth picture. Um, from not just Earth as, you know, okay, Earth was created and goes through these phases and we leave it and blah, blah, and all this. No, it's much more than that. It's a divine vehicle that became the Earth. And, of course, we're not singular in that. Other realms have their divine vehicles. We're talking about the planet Earth right now. So the planetary genius records all of our adventures, all of our initiations, all of this, <clears throat> but it filters it down to the golden nuggets. And it's these golden nuggets, excuse me, my throat is leaving me here, that will be transferred as the planetary genius into the new Earth star. We cannot ascend without the planetary genius. Somebody's got to go downstairs and grab the books <laughs> and bring them upstairs and then get in the little starcraft and ascend into the new Earth. Of course, I'm speaking here very, uh, you know, poetically and metaphorically, but that's literally what happened. They go down, certain souls are going down to claim it and bring it up at the last moment and take it through the portal. So the Swan Knights, I have to keep coming back, the Swan Knights, their journey is important as a specific cataloging within the planetary genius because it is that path that they are opening up as a whole collective swan knight grouping in through time that will help in a big way to identify the male female coordinates that we need in consciousness to be able to ascend as a planetary spectrum into the new earth aspect of our beingness now even as I say that, I realize it's rather vague, but you know, we could just go on and on with any of this stuff. We could just take it forever. And I can't do that, folks. <laughs> I'm just not, not, you know, physically able to, to sustain all of that. And you probably wouldn't want to hear it all anyway. So I'm just cutting it to the chase, you know, just the briefest of briefs here. But that's really the bottom line of the whole thing. So the Swan Knights then, are exactly as you see this fellow in the boat. He's sailing down the river. He's sailing down the stream of consciousness. And he's doing his best to follow the ordained pattern of the singularity that will evolve through the male and female harmonic as it brings into oneness and births the golden child. So that poetic statement is just about the culmination, in the words that I can put it, of what this is all about. We may be doing some more videos on this, but for now, I think I've pretty much said what I need to say about it. As I said, I really would like to do one just on Cygnus itself and, and its relationship to the Swan family on Earth and its relationship to Orion, the Pleiades, and Sirius and possibly some other systems in regard to how it shapes the, uh, now I want to say the word contiguity of the earth. I don't know that that's a word. Let me see if it is. Okay, I found it. Contiguity. I've never used it before. didn't know it existed. The state of being contiguous, contact, or proximity. A series of things in continuous connection, continuous mass, or extent. Yes, I think that about fits it. I thought I'd conclude with some nice pictures I found on the web of the Swan Knight. Different depictions. I really like this one. And remember, when you see a sword in these displays, yes, you know, we've turned it into a battleground down here. But um, really, the sword is intended to represent the sword of truth, the sort of the sword that cuts away the falsehood, that kind of thing. And that anoints with the light of truth. This is an interesting one. 
And there we have our swan knight being pulled by a swan, being pulled through Cygnus, perhaps through the sea of stars, or the rays of Cygnus, the energy emissions of Cygnus. And I just thought that was pretty, little flowers and everything. I've always loved, loved swans. Maybe that's the reason. But then who doesn't love a swan? So I'll conclude here, but I would like to say, and it's really a no-brainer, but I'd like to state it anyway, that obviously the Knights Templar, you could say that all of them, in the truest core sense, not the renegades and, you know, the ones that went off and did things we uh, wouldn't, you know, we don't approve of, but uh, the true established core Knights Templar that were dedicated to valor, the protection of the divine feminine, and indeed to an extent the adoration of the divine feminine in the sense that um, they open their hearts to receive that cord of light within them. So those Knights Templar, you can see all of them as Swan Knights. Because to become a Swan Knight, first of all, you have to have it within you somewhere. Like I said, you could be born, you know, in a terrible situation, grow up to have six chips on your shoulders and hate women. But you, if you're a swan knight, you will change. You know, there will be a point of transformation. You can be the hard way <laughs> or it can be the easy way, but it will happen. So those paragenetics will then be transferred into the stream of the genetics of that individual. And that's really the most magical quotient right there. So the swan knights of the grail, I mean, well, the grail, but the Templars were doing that as well. But they were also propagating it, the concept out into the world. And it was their intention, the original instigators of the Knights Templar, and I speak here not from some historical referencing that we know of. It may be there, but I don't know. I'm speaking from the Thoth Akashic here when I say this. But their original intention was to break free the incredibly patriarchal position of humanity at that time in a way that allowed the patriarchy to receive their power, its power consciously and directly from the divine feminine. Now, I don't mean that men have no power. <laughs> Let me qualify that. I'm just saying that in each being, if you shut off one valve, you, you eliminate the power of the other. If the heart is pumping with two valves, let's say, and you have one is the feminine, one is the masculine, and you cut off either one, you, you're destitute because the other one cannot function without it. So this was the principle of the true Knights Templar as they intended it to be. But, you know, stuff happens. And um, it didn't turn out entirely that way. They did good, but they also couldn't control the, out, <laughs> the outer rogue factor that was um, sublimated to the whole um, uh, chaotic field of the times, of the medieval times. It was dark and festering. But we've come back, haven't we, to do it again. And perhaps this time, this time in the full light of day, without any secret agendas, because it was necessary in those days if they wanted to keep their heads, or rather their keep from burning on the priors. Um, but without any of that now, in the full light of day, we can carry out the true light agenda that was offered the planet by the Templars of old. Thank you for listening.